So if you take the word and read and study the word, you have to depend on the Holy Spirit to give you divine revelation of the word. And when you have divine revelation, you can't go wrong. But that cannot come without the Holy Spirit. Those of you who do not have his spirit, those of you who are not even baptized in the Holy Spirit, you know, with the evidence, you know, you are really, really losing out. Praise the Lord. It is good to be with you today on Shekinah. And I prayed. I hope and pray that everybody had a great week in the Lord. And we are going to join our hearts in agreement. I would like to take this time to say happy birthday to um, Lydia. Lydia, happy birthday. We love you and God richly bless you. Praise God. We're going to come in agreement now. Mighty God, in Jesus' mighty name, today I give you praise and I give you thanks. Mighty God, as I, as I ask, dear God, that you will quicken your people now that have tuned in and we're trusting you that, dear God, the Spirit of God will reach the core of every heart. I pray, God, every home that has this program, Mighty God, on listening to it, we pray those homes that have unsaved loved ones, save them. Let the Spirit of God prevail in their homes, and we pray for your divine protection for those homes. We ask, dear God, in Jesus' mighty name, as the Word of God go forth, it will not return void, but it will accomplish that which you purpose it for. And I'm asking you, please, in Jesus' mighty name, to let the power of the Holy Spirit mantle your children. Let faith come alive. Let faith rise in their hearts more than ever. That's God's faith. And I pray, God, in Jesus' mighty name, as the word go forth mixed with faith, Father God, many things will be accomplished in the spirit. And we pray, God, in Jesus' mighty name, we know the modern church, dear God, is in a mess spiritually. But today we ask, dear God, even as you wrote, mighty God, to the seven churches in the book of Revelation through John, dear God, we're trusting as the word of God go forth, and mighty God, in Jesus' mighty name, we compare the church today, mighty God, with the ancient church. We're just believing with mighty God by faith. I shouldn't say the ancient church, but the church, mighty God, in Jesus' mighty name, uh, the church is according to the word. Father God, they have gone through a lot. And today it's worse because this generation is more wicked than every generation. So, God, I pray that we will understand that Jesus Christ, the Son of the Most High God, is about to put his appearance in for the church. He's coming for his bride. And Jesus is coming for a church without spot and without blemish. He's coming for a church without spot and without wrinkle. And mighty God, to make it even simpler, that Jesus is coming for a church without sin. Mighty God, that church has to be perfect. Just like you said in your word in Matthew 5, 48, that in Jesus' mighty name, be ye perfect even as you are perfect. And Lord God, let us know it's time to strive now for perfection we do not have long. Perfection does not come overnight. It does not come in a month. It does not come in a year. Perfection is something we have to strive for. And mighty God, we know that you're coming soon. And it's a good time to start because, Lord, 
The bride of Christ has to be spotless. The bride of Christ has to be without sin. So today, just open the hearts and understanding of your people. Give them the understanding of the word. And Lord, you bless them. In Jesus' mighty name, bless them. And we pray everyone will be ready for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray now that you will unctionize me. I pray, God, for the utterance, the anointing, and your presence. I thank you again in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. You know, um, when I say, uh, when I spoke, uh, when I prayed about perfection just now, I am sure that, of course, many would have their comments, you know, um, and there would be comments like these. Who, who does she think she is? And how can Jesus come for a spotless church? That is impossible. And how, how is he coming for a perfect church? That is impossible. But I need to show you the word because I'm a woman of the word and I believe in the word of God. And what it says, I take it very literal. Praise God. So we're going to turn to Matthew 5, and we're going to go to verse 38, and we're going to read Matthew 5, verse 48, and let's read. If you make sure you have your Bibles and your highlighters and, you know, just highlight the scripture, go over them over and over again. Be you, therefore, perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. So we see here, I'm going to read it again, by the way. Be you therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So we see here that the Lord himself is requiring perfection. And like I said, perfection does not come in a week or a month or a year. It is a life that you have to live. You have to strive for perfection. You have to strive for holiness. It's a daily thing. You have to you strive for it. And as you live and walk daily according to the word, you trust me. You will. You will come to that place where God would be so pleased with you. Because why? He sees and knows that you're really trying, and we have to try. Many of us have to try even harder. Praise God. Now we're going to go back to the verse uh, that I read last week. That is Ephesians chapter 5, and we will go right now to verse 27. Ephesians 5, 27. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, like I said, if you highlight the scriptures, you will go over them and ask the Holy Spirit to shed light on God's word in a fresh way. Because it's very important for you to understand what Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus. And what he's saying to the church at Ephesus He's saying, the, the, the Lord is saying to us today, the church is the church, and the word of God is for the church. And the word of God is for each and every one of us, and we must take the word of God for what it means and for what it says. We must not try to justify our wrongdoings and twist up scriptures. God is not pleased with that. For we cannot utter the word or take away from the word. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, in the last chapter, in the few last verses, you can read for yourself that if you add to the word or take away from the word, the Lord will add plagues to your life. It's very important that you understand what God is saying. Praise God. So Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Jesus is coming back for a church without sin, to make it simpler. Praise God. Now, we're going to continue now from, the, from where I have left off last week, and we're going to go now 
to the book of Revelation. I dealt with the church at Ephesus. I dealt with the church at Smyrna. I dealt with the church at Pergamos. Today, I'm dealing with the other churches. There are four more churches to deal with, and today, I would like to, to touch on those four churches. Praise God. Now, remember, like I said, that John wrote the book to the seven churches, and of course, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write to the seven churches. The state of the church in those times is no different. You know, today, I should say, well, today is worse. It's worse today because in those days, didn't have a lot of things that we have today. You know, um, the, the gospel today is preached. I mean, through media, it, it has covered, you know, the entire world. I believe with all my heart, the gospel has gone forth. And I believe with all my heart that there is nothing left for the coming of the Lord. Everything in this book is already fulfilled. And I believe with all my heart, Jesus is on his way. A lot of people don't think so. It is tragic. But we will see, you know, with our own eyes, we will see, you know, the many, many things that are about to take place. That is, you think that the pandemic was bad. The pandemic, well, it's still on anyways because we have the variant to cope with. We have the Delta to cope with and whatever else is coming. But I'm not just talking about pandemic here. I'm talking about, you know, wickedness and, you know, evil is increasing more and more. The young people, I mean, they are... They're spiritually speaking, they, they don't want nothing to do with God, many, many of our young people. And I thank God for those of our young people that are really, really trying to really seek God and to serve him. But there are many, many young people out there. I have grandchildren myself. They want to hear nothing about God. But you know, God is good and he is great. So I'm reading now from the book of Revelation, and we will go to, to chapter uh, chapter 2 from verse 18. I'm reading. This is the church at Thyatira. Like I said, we cover all three churches uh, last week. So we're going to go to the fourth one now. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame, a flame of fire, and his feet, and his feet are like fine brass. I know your works and charity and service and faith and your patience and your works and the last to be more than the first. Now, <laughs> I must say this is the church of Thyatira represents the papal church. The papal church is uh, the Catholics. So, the papal church signifies the beginning of Catholicism. And trust me, um, that was the beginning. Today, it's rampant all over the world. And it's very, very sad because there is a lot of things that are not right. Now, we know that one thing I like about our Lord and Savior, he is a God of order. He's not a God of confusion. And once, he's, once he said to John that you must write to the seven churches what I tell you and what I show you, he is not going to leave out anyone or anything. Our Lord and Savior, the Holy, you know, the Holy Spirit, working in John, writing through him, speaking through him. Of course, every church is addressed here in these seven churches. So this is the papal church here. We're dealing here now with Catholicism. I know your works and charity and service and faith and your patience and your works and the last to be more than the first. Verse 19. 
we know for sure that uh, Catholicism, you can liken that church to a lot of idolatry. Um, it's a lot about idols and you name it. When the angel visited Mary, and even in her song, you know, the, the Magnificat, the song she sang, we, we, I remember very clearly at one point it was said, Blessed be thou among women. It did not say, that the word of God did not say, Blessed are thou above women. It says among women. And Mary was so gracious. She's such a sweet, sweet young lady. She said in her song, the Magnificat, she said, The Lord has regarded me in my low estate. Today, Catholics are putting her above women. But the Bible did not say that. You see, you have to read the word. It's not about your little catechism. You have to read the Bible. You have to understand what the scripture is saying. That is why if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you will, you will be void of understanding because it's the Holy Spirit that helps us to quicken this word as we study the word, as we read the word. It's the Holy Spirit that quickens us to reveal Jesus through the scriptures. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're a very sad case because you cannot understand this word without the Holy Spirit. Praise God. I can remember, I think it was just last night I was praying and I was asking God, I said, Lord, I do not want the letter. I want the spirit. The word of God teaches us the letter kill it. You take your Bible and you read from cover to cover. You're, all these letters in this word, the Bible says, kills. But it's the spirit that quicken it. So if you take the word and read and study the word, you have to depend on the Holy Spirit to give you divine revelation of the word. And when you have divine revelation, you can't go wrong. But that cannot come without the Holy Spirit. Those of you who do not have his spirit, those of you who are not even baptized in the Holy Spirit, you know, with the evidence, you know, you are really, really losing out. And you need to seek God day and night and ask him to fill you with his spirit. Ask the Lord that you will be, you know, you must be born again. You must not have a form of godliness and denying the power. God doesn't want a form of anything. God doesn't want a religious crowd. God wants a people to have a solid relationship with him. I cannot go by one day without praying and studying this word because I want my relationship with God to be solid, to be very sound, so that when I am preaching or teaching, I don't sound foolish. It must line up with the word of God. Praise the Lord. Now, listen what it says. It says here, verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against you because you suffer that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, what the Lord is speaking here about, this church at Thyatira, like the church at Ephesus, like 
the church at Pergamos and like the church at, you know, at Smyrna was good. Smyrna was good. The church at Smyrna was very good. But, you know, the church at Smyrna was very poor, but yet God says they were rich. So I was trying to tell you last week that, you know, it's not, the life does not consist in the abundance of things that we possess. That's not life. Material stuff is not life. Having billions of dollars in the bank, that's not life. Life, your billion dollar, can't save you. Life outside of Christ is no life. Now, but our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he had a few things that he had issues with the church at Ephesus. He had he, he said very, very clearly some hard stuff. The, you know, many of them left their first love, you name it. The church at Pergamos, they had the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which, of course, God hates because it's, it, you know, it's weird. It's the doctrine of Balak and Balaam, and it's very weird, very silly. Now, God is saying here, so you would see this word withstanding, or you would see the words, but I have a few things against you. There are these churches, all these seven churches have very good commendations from the Lord. But there are things that God was not pleased with. So let us go to verse 20. Now, the Lord is speaking here of spiritual fornication and adultery, which means they had forsaken Christ and the cross for other things. Right? If you were to study Catholicism, Mary is it. Praise the Lord. So where is the cross? So that is why, you know, this church, you can liken the church to Catholicism. They, a lot, there are a lot of idols and do not have the, the, the very deep teachings about the Holy Spirit. And they talk about it, but there's no life. And you name it, it's there. So what I would like to say is that this church at Thyatira had forsaken Christ and they turned, they turned away from Christ and they went into idolatry and other stuff. God is good. 21. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Now, we know that salvation is not by works, right? Catholicism, there is a lot of works there, you name it. But salvation is not by works. No matter how much good things you do, you cannot earn your way to heaven. Salvation is not by works. It's not by the kind things that you do. Mind you, works are very important because if you were to study the book of James, which is just before Revelation, down that end, you know, um, I know Judas before Revelation, but James is along that line. If you were to study the book of James, the word of God teaches that, you know, that faith without works is dead. So we have to have kind, we have to be kind, we have to have works, because faith without works is dead. And if you don't have works, you won't, you won't have any type of rewards in heaven. Not that, you know, um, like, you know, God is good, like, I'm not going to do stuff to get rewards from heaven, trust me, I don't, de you don't, I don't even deserve to be saved. You know, I'm so unworthy, praise God. But you have to have works because there are rewards that God will give out in heaven for good works. But you can't be saved by good works. You can feed the whole world. You can, you know, you can do many, many great things when the day comes. But you can't be saved by that. Salvation is not of works. Salvation is a gift of God. And because it's a gift, it is freely given to you. And it's for a whosoever will, let him come. 
Salvation is not forced on anybody. God do not force his will on anyone. Salvation is a free gift. Praise the Lord. When Nicodemus in John chapter 3 came to our Lord and Savior Jesus by night, Nicodemus was a very, very prominent man, very, very brilliant. He was a leader. And he came to Jesus by night and he asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, there's a lot in that story which I wouldn't want to um, be detoured by. Let's stay very focused here. What I would like to say is that you got to be born again. And once you're born again, it's good to have good works. It's, do, it's good to help people. It's good to be kind to people. It's good to be, you know, to do kind things. Works is very important. But works alone cannot get you to heaven. I cannot put enough emphasis on that. Works alone can't get you there. You have to be saved, washed in the blood. You have to be born again, just like Jesus said to Nicodemus. Now, I will continue to read. Verse 22. The Lord is saying in verse 21, He gave this church space to repent, but they never repented. Praise the Lord. So verse 22 now. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Now, the bed here refers, refers to false teachers who taught salvation by works, which was spiritual adul adultery. And there was a serious warning here that they have to repent. But they don't want to repent. And that is tragic. If you are a child of God or you want to serve God, you want to make heaven, you have to live in repentance daily because though you're a Christian, you know, bad thoughts come. You know, you have a bad attitude. You, you know, you lose it. You swear sometimes. You tell a lot of lies and you name it. And those things are wrong. So when you do that as a Christian, you have to repent. Much more, you know, they're unsaved. If they don't repent, they have no hope of heaven. When the Christians sin and they go quickly and repent, there is hope for a comeback because God says, when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. The only thing I hate about this modern, modern church is that they're very presumptuous, you know, they repent and they play church. They repent, come back, repent, come back. No, no, no. God doesn't have time for that. So that is what I don't like about the modern church. You know, they are so, they, I think the church have the biggest hypocrites in the world. You think hypocrites are out there, you know, um, that are not saved, yes. But the biggest hypocrites are right in the church. Because they, ha they, they don't have any reverence for the Holy Spirit. They don't have any respect for God. They don't have any respect for the Word. They don't have any respect for, you know, and they, what should I say? They don't have any respect as children of God, as in, you know, honoring God by walking pure and holy. That is acceptable. But when you're going to play church and, and, you know, you're going to go here, you know, here why all kinds of sins, all kinds of, you know, people are gay, people are fornicating, people are in adultery, people are in witchcraft, people, you know, they are very religious, they don't want to, the word, they don't want to pray, and they find the scripture to justify their wrongdoings, they twist things up, that's bad, that is bad. The Bible calls you, you're trampling the blood of Jesus all over again. And you're putting, you're putting him to open shame, according to the book of Hebrews. 
you know, I love the word. I like to study the word. But I'm not going to be a woman of the word and don't live it. I have to live the word once I believe the word. And a lot of times we don't believe. We struggle with doubt and unbelief. That is why we live like the devil. And that is not right. You got to smarten up. You got to come clean. And you have to strive for perfection. Because the Lord is coming for a perfect church. And I say that, of course, without reservation. He's coming for a perfect church. And the word of God says it. Praise the Lord. A church without spot or wrinkle. Now, it says here, verse 23, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Now, when the Lord is saying he will kill their children with death in this church, he doesn't mean physical death. They, they, of course, when you're not living, you know, for the Lord, you have turned your back on the cross. Of course, you will encounter spiritual death. And spiritual death, trust me, is worse than physical death. Because if you die spiritually, praise the Lord, you, can't, you have no hope of making heaven if you die spiritually. And a lot of churches, in this modern church today, we have a lot of Christians that are spiritually dead. All they have is a form of godliness and denying the power of God. And everybody think it's okay and, you know, every church, you know, that they're saved and washed in the blood. They believe in some things in the Bible and they don't believe some things. You got to believe the whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Praise the Lord. You can't believe some and don't believe some. That is massive confusion. You have a form of godliness when you are like that. Praise the Lord. And like I said, God doesn't want a form of anything. He wants a solid relationship with his children. Praise God. So, he says, I know their hearts. And that's true. A lot of people think that they can sin, you know, all the time and get off with it. As Christians, you can't get off with it. Guess why? Jesus tried the hearts and reins of man. Jesus doesn't deal with our head or how we look on the outside, our attire. He doesn't, he doesn't deal with those things. What you are on the outside, he couldn't care less. Praise the Lord. What God deals with is the heart. Praise God. And he said it clearly in the book of Acts. God said to David, God said in his word that David is a man after his own heart. So if your heart is not pure, praise God, you're in trouble with God. You're in trouble with God. And you think that you can live it up? And you can get off lightly. Trust me, you may even go in deep repentance. And God will accept your repentance. But you have to pay dear for your sin. If I have to, if I had the time to take you to, you know, to the Old Testament and show you what David did. You know, I mean, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And you know. The child is born, and the Lord sent a message with Nathan. God always has people to warn you. The prophet Nathan. And David took that very seriously. And while this child was sick when it was born, David is repenting in sackcloth and ashes seven days straight. And trust me, God heard David's prayers. God, you know, he forgave David, great man of God, and come on. What happened? The child died. So payday is a must. 
God will have mercy in here or repenting, and he will forgive. But don't think you can go back and come in and out of sin. No, no, no. That's not going to work. That's not going to work with God. You got to come clean. You got to get real. Mistakes we do make, but repent of them and don't go back to the stuff and live whole year in repentance, in and out of sin. That won't work. Now listen what it says. It says, I will try the hearts and reins. I will give unto every one of you according to your works. And that's true. You can be certain of one thing. What you sow, you have to reap. 24. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak. Praise God. The teaching of Jezebel. Praise God. That is very, very serious. She wanted to seduce, you know, all the prophets and, and teachers, in other words, all the preachers and whatever, whatever. And what the Lord is saying here, this church doesn't know the depth of Satan. Now, we have preachers are so blind in the church. It's not funny. You know, Satan will come in. Satan have his agents. They will sit. They will, they, will, they will chant. They will do everything. They'll go to the washroom, and they will drop all their nasty, evil stuff. And the preachers don't know nothing. They don't have discernment. They don't have a clue. You're a sad case. I do my homework from home. I do my homework when I go home. And all I pray is, God, save them. I don't pray bad for them, but whatever was, whatever was placed, whatever was dropped, whatever chanting, whatever, nothing will take effect. And if you're a blind preacher, start asking God for sight because your congregation will be disturbed. Will, your con congregation will be destroyed at your expense, preacher. And when I say expense, it doesn't involve dollars and cents. You will pay dear for not leading your flock and having eyes of discernment to cover your people and pray for them. It is very serious. Praise God. You'll pay very dear because when God places responsibility in your hands, you better lead with integrity and you better lead with every fiber in your being, knowing you will live before his faith to protect the flock. God is a good God. Now listen to this. 25. He says, you don't know the depths of Satan, 24, as they speak. I will put, I will put upon you none other burden. Praise God. But that which you have already, hold fast till I come. Now, whatever little they have, God, the Lord is warning them. Make sure you repent and I will have mercy on you. And the Lord is saying to them, hold on until the rapture takes place. Praise God. And he who overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nation. Praise God. It is very, very important that you realize to all the churches here, there is always a if or a but or a notwithstanding because God has you know, he has to address these churches for what they are. And these churches today, the modern church, are worse than these, all what the Lord had to say about these churches here. I mean, worse. I've never seen wickedness since I born. I mean, the church is in a terrible state. But God is good. Guess what? He has a remnant. He has a remnant. Though the children of Israel, he says, shall be as the sand of the seas, only a remnant shall be saved. He has a remnant. 
and he's talking to Israel and spiritual Israel, which is, you know, us born-again Christians. We are spiritual Jews. Praise God. And he who overcomes will keep my word to the end. To him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I receive of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Praise the Lord. There is a lot that God had to say to this church at Thyatira, lots. As we can see here, they had a lot, but they did not understand the depths of Satan. If I had time to expound on that, you know, I would have. You have to ask God for discernment. You have to ask, ask God for divine revelation. You have to ask God for clarity. You have to make sure that you stay very focused. You have to make sure that you don't live a compromising life. Live an, as an example to your flock. Praise God. And if you can't live as, as an example, get your behind out of the pulpit and stop fooling people and stop with your acting because no matter how you act, no matter how good an actor you are or an actress, I would like you to know God will show you up. We will go now to the church at Sardis. Praise God. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. That you have a name that you live, but you're dead. What a rebuke. You talk about rebuke. It's getting hotter now. To the church at Sardis, it's just like the church today. We have the big names. We have the big choirs, the rope choirs. We have the plush seats and the plush, the plush carpets. And we have, you know, the, the grand piano and we have everything. You name it. There's more stiff than starch. But listen. Many churches today, they have a name. But God said here, they have a name, but they are dead. They have a name that they live up to, but they are dead. Can you imagine having a name, but you're dead as a doornail? No, no. Listen, the Christians got to get on fire. The Christians got to be full of power. The Christians got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. The Christians have to know their God. All Christians, you're labeling yourself as a Christian. If you don't have these things, you're not a Christian. Excuse me? The Christians it shouldn't be dead. Listen, the same spirit that raised up Jesus dwells in us. Praise God. He did not die and is still in the tomb. He's alive. He's risen. Jesus is alive. And if Jesus is alive in you, you will have life. You will have grace. You will have strength. You will have the power to live over sin. If Jesus is not alive in you, then of course, you will not have the power to live over sin. Your sin will have dominion over you. And the word did not say that. The word said sin shall not have dominion over us. So which means you have a name, but you don't have a life. You're dead. What a state to be in. Let's read. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Perfect. Look at the word here. God wants perfection and it does not come overnight and they have a sharp rebuke because God is saying that he has not found their works perfect praise the Lord listen God's love is pure 
God's love is clean. God's love is flawless. And if you're a Christian and you don't have that love in you, God's love, not your love, fill your love, flesh love. I'm talking about God's agape love. If you have God's love in you, whatever you do, God will be pleased with it. Praise God. And if you don't have God's love in you, you have Satan in you. That's it. That's, that's about it. For I've not found your works perfect before God. Their works were based on dead faith. Can you imagine? You know, when you have Jesus, you're alive and well. Praise God. They, they, they just have dead works, dead faith, and produces dead stuff. Praise God. That's not good. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, and hold fast and repent. In other words, God is saying to this church at Sardis, get back to the cross quickly. Go back and repent. Go back. The cross, remember, is the object of our faith. And God is saying, go back to the cross. Get back to Calvary. If therefore you shall not watch, I will come on you as a thief, and, I will, I sh and you shall not know what hour I will come. Praise God. Now, this is spiritual blindness here. If you're living spiritually blind and you're not looking for the Lord, you won't, he won't come for you. You can't walk spiritually blind. You have to ask God to open your eyes spiritually. Four, you have a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And that's true. In every church under this sun, you have a remnant of people that are paying a price for holiness and righteousness and purity. Those people are walking in God's agape love because they have that agape love, not the flesh love they're carrying on. No, no, no. Flesh love profits nothing. Because they have God's love, they're walking worthy. They're walking in white. In other words, they're walking pure. And this church had some, the Lord says, you know, and he says they, he, there is a remnant that uh, there is a few, in other words, that walks worthy. And in, a, in every church under the sun, in the modern day church, there is a remnant. Trust me, there is a few. Praise God. He who overcomes the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will, blot, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his holy angels. Here is a sharp rebuke for those of you who believe in eternal security doctrine. The Lord is saying, if you repent, I will not blot out your name from my book. There is a book. And God is keeping records. You have preachers today preaching that your name, once you're saved, you're sealed. Excuse me. If you live like the devil and you call yourself a Christian, and you're saying that their names won't be blotted out, it's out the book. Sorry. It's only those who walk worthy, their names will remain in that book. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church, to the churches. Praise God. Now, the Lord has a lot to say about the overcomer. You have to walk as an overcomer. A lot of people, you know, call themselves Christians when they're faced with the little trials and testings in life. They fold up. They murmur, they grumble, they complain, they have cancer, they start to, to waver, they start to doubt, they start to ask God questions. You know, they're struck with all kinds of diseases and aches and pains. They ask God all kinds of questions. No, I don't have a problem. I ask God a lot of questions. I don't have a problem with, with asking God questions. But listen. If you're a child of God, you have to walk as an overcomer. Whatever God places your way, just how, the, you know, how you handle it will determine your next level. God, God allows things to come our way for one reason, 
to really, really strengthen us, to really, really encourage us in our faith in him. God allows things to come our way to that, you know, those things will either make us or break us. In other words, God allowed things to come our way to really test us to see what we are made of, right? And I can take that very, very far now, but I don't have the time. What are you made of? Are you, you know, the, the Bible says that if your foundation is made from stubble or wood or hay, your foundation is not solid because fire will burn up all of those. But if your foundation is built on the rock, the rock, the solid rock, which is Jesus Christ, you know, then of course you have a solid foundation. And many, many Christians today don't have a solid foundation. They are playing. And what you build off, whatever material of all those things I mentioned, you better start building on the rock, the solid rock. Christ is that rock. Praise God. Live as an overcomer. Every test you come your way, pass the test in flying colors. Just pass the test. Praise God. If you pass the test in flying colors, God will promote you to another level. If you're not tested and tried, then, of course, he can't trust you with stuff. He can't trust you with his anointing and his power. He can't trust you to, to be a leader. He can't trust you. You say, well, Pastor Jean, I'm not looking for to be a leader. I, well, it's just something I'm just saying. You know, whether you're a leader, you stand behind a pulpit, or whether you shake hands at the door, you're a leader. You're a leader, whether you believe it or not. You're a leader, and your, your, your light should shine. You don't have to stand behind the pulpit to be a leader. Praise the Lord. God is good. So it's very important you walk as an overcomer. The church at Philadelphia. And to the angel, which is the pastor, the pastor in the seven churches are referred to as angels. Praise God. Some of them are worse than the devil in the modern church. That is true. And it is sad. Praise God. And to the angel, which is the pastor of the church in Philadelphia, right? These things says he who is holy. He who is true. He who has the key of David. He who opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man's open. Praise God. Now, this church has a lot of authority. But we're going to see there is always a but to every church. I know your works, and behold, I've set before you an open door, and no man can shut it. This open door, of course, it's, the go it's about the gospel going to the world. For you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. I love that. This church at Philadelphia has kept God's word. They have not denied his name. And the word of God is saying here, God is saying to this church, you have a little strength. You have not denied my name, and you have kept my word. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Praise God. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. This is heavy stuff here. You know, it has a lot to do, you know, with, with Israel. It has a lot to do with the coming kingdom age. It has a lot to do with Israel being restored and so forth. Let's go to verse 10. Because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon you, which shall come upon all the world to try them who dwell upon the earth. It's talking here about the ch this church will be raptured out, of, out before the great tribulation. Right? 
in the, in the great tribulation period, there would be a lot happening. And what God is saying, you know, well, whoever Jews, whoever, you know, Gentile would be saved. We are spiritual Jews. When a Gentile is saved, you call them a spiritual Jew. God is saying that he will keep his children out of the great tribulation. In other words, he will keep them so that they will make the rapture. Praise God. And it's, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful what he says here. He says, he will keep them from the hour of temptation. There is a people that no matter what Satan does, Satan will not get them to do stuff that's wrong. And because of that pure love that, you know, you have for Christ, you will be kept in the hour of temptation. Trust me, that pure love is what does it. Because if you truly love God, the Bible says you will keep his commandments. So no matter what the devil does, he can lure you into stuff, into sin. Twelve. Him who overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Praise God. Now, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Praise the Lord. So, the church at Philadelphia had a lot of good stuff. We're going to go to the last church now. The church at Laodicea. Now, let us hear what God has to say to this church. And this is the last church. Unto the angel, unto the pastor of the church at Laodicea. Like I said, angel means pastor. And, you know, um, God is looking at a lot of pastors in the modern church. And... Are you an angel, pastor? You better get with the program. And don't operate like the devil because God sees everything. All right? Listen what it says. The church at Laodicea, right. These things says the amen, the faithful and true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. Look at this. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Now, the Word of God teaches us if you're not cold or hot, you know, He will spew you out because you can't be lukewarm. You got to, it's either you're cold, you're hot. If you're lukewarm, He'll spew you out. Praise God. Listen what it says. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. And of course, this characterizes the present day church. You have a lot going on in our church, like I said, our churches. I would that you were cold, you were cold or hot. What God is saying here, half measures would not do. You're either cold or you're either hot. Praise God. So then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now, the lukewarm and the cold dead church, it's, it's because of sin. It's because of sin. I don't know about you. I can walk in a church service and I can tell you right away if the anointing is there or not. And I don't have to sit for long. Just give me five minutes. And I will tell you if the anointing is there or not or if it's just flesh carrying on. Isn't God good? He said to this church, he will spew them out. Praise God. You can see in this church, there's no respect for repentance. The Laodicean church was very rich, very, very wealthy. But there's no repentance. They, this church, there's no repentance. They don't want to come out from their comfort zone and get with the price. 
get with paying the price. Respect the work of the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit have control, not this church. So God is saying that, okay, you don't want to repent. You don't want restoration. Then you'll have divine rejection. And when God rejects you, he rejects you. You say, is that possible? Yeah. He rejected Esau, didn't he? Esau sought repentance carefully with tears, but he received none. Because you say, verse 17, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. This church had material goods. A lot of material stuff. Right? And know it's not that you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. Isn't this tragic? Praise God. They gloated over material wealth. They gloated over stuff. But spiritually, they were spiritually poor. This church lived in poverty spiritually. Now, you want the past church, but spiritually everybody's dead. It ain't going to happen. Praise God. Spiritual poverty, isn't this indicative of the modern church? It's true. The church has nothing. We don't want his presence. We don't want his anointing. We don't want his Holy Spirit. We want flesh. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. Praise God. Gold tried in the fire? The modern church today is not interested in that. Nobody wants to pay a price. Gold tried in fire? That is heavy, heavy testings, trials, tribulation. We're tested. We're led as sheep to the slaughter every day. You name it. This church didn't want that. The modern church doesn't want that. Everything must go smooth. The modern church is all about prosperity. It's all about wealth and riches, lots of money. But spiritually, they have nothing. A little heat comes, they fold up. Praise God. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and raiment and white raiment that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. Praise God. God is trying to tell the church here, Get clean. Become, you know, try to live holy. Try to walk pure. Praise God. This whole verse here refers to righteousness, which is exclusively Christ. Christ is the only righteous one. Praise God. And, and in Jesus' name, this Laodicean church was extremely self-righteous. Extremely self-righteous. They don't have the righteousness of Christ. Praise God. They're naked spiritually, naked, blind. The Bible calls them wretched. And anoint your eyes with thy soul that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, and be zealous therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will stop with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes will I grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Let me close the book. Now, like I said to all the seven churches, there was a lot of good commendation. But our Lord and Savior had always a but about every church. It's always a notwithstanding or a but. I would like you to know the modern church is in, what should I say, 90% worse state than what we read about these churches here. The modern church 
is in a sad state. I would encourage every pastor, get serious with God. And the people that God has entrusted you with, if you are playing games and don't preach the truth and you're compromising, all those people's blood will be dripping on you. To all Christians, live and walk pure. Get it right and quickly because God is coming for a perfect church. That's the word. And only this word will stand because the Bible says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but this word will always stand. There is nothing in this word that God says he doesn't mean. He means every word. I would encourage you, clean up. Get in the word. Study the word. Get what you hear, whatever is preached. Go, go it over and over. Listen to the messages over and over. You know, make sure that you send out, send out the information about, you know, about Shekinah to your friends and families. It's very important. It's a church that preaches the truth. And people will know the truth, and the truth will set them free. Now, you have heard the word of the Lord. The church is not a building. The church is a people. You have to take inventory of your life and see where you're at. Are you going to be a child of God? that the Lord is pleased with? Are you going to be in that remnant that God spoke about? In every church, he has a remnant. Are you going to be in that remnant? Or are you going to continue with your wickedness? The choice is yours. God doesn't force his will on anyone. Let's pray. To all sinners, You want to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Pray after me. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I do repent. I have done some terrible things. But I do repent because you're a merciful God. Come into my heart as my Lord and my Savior. And I thank you, Lord, for giving me a chance to serve you, and to make heaven. I pray, God, that you will deliver me from the world. And I thank you today in Jesus' mighty name for saving my soul and making me whole. I'm talking now to all Christians. You know your life. You know your walk. And we are going to pray now. All Christians, Lord, I know I'm a backslider. I do not take heed to your word. I play church all the time. And Lord, I do repent. I want to be in the remnant. You have a remnant in every church on the, in this universe. You have a remnant. I want to be in the remnant. Lord, I pray that I will totally yield my life to the Holy Spirit and that you will clean me up so I can serve you in spirit and in truth. I can live in the spirit. I can walk in the spirit because they that are led by the spirit are the sons of God. And Lord Jesus, just deliver me and have mercy upon me and help me now to strive for perfection. Help me now to respect the Holy Spirit, to respect God Almighty, and to respect what Jesus did for me on the cross. Help me to have reverence and respect. Mighty God, and take my walk with God serious. 
Please help me, Lord. I'm totally depending, dependent on you. Holy Spirit, please help me as I yield myself to you. In Jesus' mighty name, I invite you afresh in my heart as my Lord and Savior, and I say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God richly bless you, and we love you, and may God continue to help you by his Spirit. Only as you yield to him, that will be possible. What you give him is what he has to work with. And if you don't live a yielded life, he has nothing to work with. For it's not by might, nor by power, but by his spirit, said the Lord. Walk in the spirit, live in the spirit. God richly bless you.